homeschooling at home during COVID-19, presented in partnership with the UC Ergonomics Program at UC Berkeley and UCSF. At this time, I'm pleased to present our presenter, Melissa Afterman. Melissa is a board certified professional ergonomist with 20 years of consulting experience and is part of the UC Ergonomics Research and Graduate Training Program. She works with organizations on ergonomics program development, risk assessment and mitigation, and tool evaluation and design for industrial and knowledge workers. Thank you for joining us, Melissa. Thank you, Jessica, and hello, everybody. Thanks for, for joining in this afternoon. Uh, in addition to the nice introduction that Jessica provided, I wanted to tell you just a little bit more about me. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I am a consultant with the UC Ergonomics Research and Training Program, and I also am a, the owner of a business called Learn Ergo, which is a consulting company that specializes in virtual home office evaluations. Now, I've been doing that for the last three years, which, uh, you know, long before it was the only way we could do ergonomics evaluations. So I feel very uh, prepared for this situation that we, uh, that we find ourselves in. Um, but my favorite job, actually, is uh, in addition to being a consultant and an instructor, is being a mother to Madison, my fourth grade son. Being a parent and watching our children grow up uh, using technology from very young ages really highlights the opportunity that we have to teach them good practices now that they can carry with them through into their working years. You know, the students uh, across the nation are starting to use Chromebooks in third grade and iPads or, or tablets earlier than that. And so if we can, you know, really focus on um, prevention through design by teaching our young people good practices, we can focus on, uh, on other aspects of ergonomics instead of breaking those bad habits when they're older. So I, I really um, am delighted to be able to talk to you about the, the work that, um, that we've done with schooling and, and ergonomics at home. So not only will we talk about students, but we will also talk about workers. And now workers and students that are, you know, all working from home in a very different way than we used to work from home. So, you know, this remote working that we're doing now and this remote learning that we're doing now is really, you know, I've been, I've heard it called crisis, crisis mode or crisis learning and crisis school mode. And, and that feels very dramatic, but the reality is that this is all very dramatic in, in many different ways, um, especially in, you know, we don't have access to the furniture and equipment and, and structure that we had in our normal classrooms and work environments. So this environment that we find ourselves working in during the pandemic is unique and requires a unique focus. Uh, before I move on with the, the content, I'd love to open the, the polling feature up to the audience and find out who's on the line. Uh, I know that there's a, a good number of us that joined in today. So if you could take a moment and respond and choose the option that best describes your role, I would, uh, I'd appreciate that. And I think it'll be interesting for the rest of us too. So I see a lot of remote workers. Uh, make sure that if you're a remote worker who is also parenting and remote schooling, that you notice that option as well. And we'll go ahead and uh, let those numbers climb. It looks like we've got a lot of workers, uh, which is, is not surprising. That's, that's good. And thank you for your participation in that. There's going to be a number of polls throughout the webinar. Uh, so I invite you to participate in those um, as a way to, to interact with the material and uh, just inform each other of, of the situation. I'm going to minimize that window so it doesn't block our screen and keep moving. Whoops, it's, I think it might be blocking. Let's minimize that. Great. So in the last couple of months, I've spent a lot of time thinking about workers and students and, and preparing handouts and videos and trainings and webinars. And I've done a lot of thinking about workers and students individually. Um, and, and what occurred to me as I was compiling my, my material for this webinar today is they're really not all that different. Um, 
it, it, we, at first glance, we think they are and that we need to have lists of, of recommendations for students and lists of recommendations for workers. But when I really look at it, they're not all that different. Uh, we all are faced with similar challenges to we, with the physical workspace that we are, are working with, whether that's you know, working on a tablet or a laptop and the, the screen size of that device. Um, perhaps we don't have access to keyboards, mouse and monitor at home. Uh, the desk and chair situation may not be ideal and the reduction in movement or the or lack of exercise um, is, is a challenge to our physical well-being. Uh, similarly, our cognitive load is challenged in this time. The, 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 the time management piece is, um, is is, is certainly a big deal for, for students, you know, older students that perhaps are given flexibility in their workday to, to accomplish tasks, but maybe they don't have the, the time management skills to, to navigate that without having added stress. Uh, same goes for workers, you know, trying to juggle on, and all of the, the tasks that need to get done during the day, um, which are very varied at this point, uh, that really increases our cognitive load. The video meetings, this is something that I think we can all agree is, um, is not easy. It's, it, it's, it can be uncomfortable, it can be um, a hassle. There's a lot of pieces to balance during a video meeting, you know, whether you're trying to hope that your connection is stable and trying to take um, cues from people on, on meetings without actually being able to see them so that you speak over them or you, you know, your voice isn't heard because your mute button didn't come off or, or there, you know, how do you look on your meeting and is somebody looking at the, the, the background of your room so there's all these pieces that your brain is working on during your video meeting, you know, not to mention the actual reason that you're at the meeting. So that, you know, whereas we used to just go to a meeting to talk about a topic, and now we have all these additional pieces that, that weigh on our cognitive uh, load or overload it can be. Uh, and then having the, the small screens is another challenge for our, our, our brains. We you know having to either toggle between open open windows to deal with multiple documents or zooming in and zooming out you know this is adding additional um, loading on our on our cognition and our brain which is taking away from the, the the project at hand or the the lesson at hand so these are all real things that both students and workers are experiencing and uh, not to mention the impact of the psychosocial factors on our well-being uh, these psych you know, the idea the reality of the isolation and the, the reduction in our social support uh, whether it's in, for a student that isn't playing on the playground during recess with their friends and physically touching and, and you know, playing with them, um, or maybe it's just the isolation that we feel from our friends and our family that we see on a regular basis, and now we have to see them through a, a Zoom video conference. So that isolation is real, and it affects our well-being. Uh, motivation is a factor. For sure, uh, in terms, you know, a lot of students are in a situation where they are, the accountability is, is not there. Uh, the, perhaps the homeschool or the remote schooling is voluntary and perhaps there's no grades being given. And so what's motivating in that situation, um, it, it's, it's a, you gotta dig down deep to find motivation when, when those levels of accountability are, are lowered or down altogether. And this, finally, this idea of locus of control. So we, the locus of control is, um, is so sort of how much control you have over a situation, whether internally or externally. So where, you know, before this shelter in place, we had a lot more control over our lives. We, and now, you know, literally have lost that control because we have to stay in, in our homes. And so losing that level of control or, or that locus of control changing is, um, it certainly affects our well being and can affect our stress level. So all of these physical, cognitive, and psychosocial factors um, are experienced by both students and workers. We're all in the same boat in different, in, 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 these, in these ways. 
We do have a few unique challenges though, you know, for students, um, the, their parents aren't teachers. It's not the same. Uh, parents can, can, can attest to that too, I'm sure. Uh, students may be new to email and online classroom systems. They're missing out on their PE and their recess time with their friends. Uh, this lack of accountability that, we, that I mentioned. And they, they're often the last served in the household in terms of furniture, space, and equipment. And what I mean by that is if there is an office in the home, I, it's most likely not be given to the student. It's most likely given to the working parent that is trying to maintain their job to continue to, you know, to put food on the table. Uh, so, you know, if there's a keyboard and a mouse or perhaps an ergonomic chair, it's most likely not going to go to the student. So those are some unique challenges for students. But the workers also have unique challenges. Um, the level of multitasking or the degree of multitasking that workers are, especially um, workers with children are faced with is, is, is really overwhelming. Uh, between remote schooling and staying on instant messaging for whether it's for work or for, for personal, you know, text messages, uh, keeping the home going, making meals, cleaning the home, you know, parenting your child, making sure that they're well and cared for, and all of that while you're also trying to work. This level, it's just, it's, it's completely overwhelming for workers. Uh, because we know that we that humans don't actually multitask. They can't do more than one thing at once. It's more of a, a task switching. And so it's no wonder that workers are exhausted by the end of the day when they're trying to get through all of this. So this is unique to, to the, the grown-ups of the house. Um, but also workers are missing out on, you know, the, the, the small talk at work, the water cooler conversations. These days, you know, in these situations, when, when we talk to our work colleagues, we talk about work because we want to get off that Zoom call as quick as we can. So we're missing out on that social interaction. Uh, and similarly, the, the, the impromptu collaboration that comes when working in a, in a in an office space or in a collaborative environment, uh, that's really lost as well. And so we're faced with more of isolated thinking and processing. So these, you know, these, all of these challenges, whether they're physical, cognitive, or psychosocial, they are, they're real. And we need to identify them and call them out because a, a lot of people, I think at this point, two months in are feeling very tired and it's no wonder. So what I'd like to do in the remainder of our time is provide you with solutions. Solutions to address all of these areas that we've talked about. And my solutions will, will be for students and workers combined. And you will find yourself and your family members somewhere in, in the middle there. Um, and so take what you can from this. And I hope that you can take you know, a number of things with you to implement. Um, I try to provide creative solutions that help you work with what you have. Uh, again, we don't have the, as easy access to goods as we normally do, um, whether it's physically going to a store or ordering them, things are, are not as easy to get and money is tight. So I'm trying to show you solutions that work with what you have. So we'll go ahead and start with the physical workspace. Uh, and before we do that, I'm curious, who's take, we'll have poll number two here. Uh, so chime in and let us know if you have taken time to set up a, a workspace at home. Have you taken any time to do that or no, you're just using your laptop around the house? Oh good, look at that. That makes, a, that makes an ergonomist happy. Looks like most people have taken a little time to set things up. Um, that's great, that's interesting. So the, the rest of you, um, I hope that we inspire you here today and you can uh, spend your afternoon setting up your workspace. All right, I'm gonna minimize that and keep moving here. Thank you for your input. Okay. There are a lot of variables when we consider the physical workspace at home. Uh, the technology variable, you know, what device are you using and what external, do you have a keyboard, mouse, or monitor? So there's that variable. There's the, the space variable. What room are you working in? There's, you know, some, some houses have many options. Other houses do not have many options. So which room are you working in? And then the, the variables in terms of the household items that you have available. So like I said, I'm going to provide you with some solutions that you can use the stuff that you have around your house. And so, you know, 
which of these items do you have that you can get creative with and put into play to help make your physical workspace support your body in a, in a, in a good posture. So we'll talk about using game boxes and a cutting board and an ironing board and pillows and towels. And, uh, and so hopefully there's some, there's some tips in here that will be helpful for you. So let's have you chime in one more time and uh, let us know what room from your home you're primarily working in. This will be poll number three. We'll see, where's, where are people working here? Ooh, it's all, it's a tie, okay. Okay, so good amount of folks that have a desk in some room somewhere, and then the dining room, that's a common one. Okay, this is interesting. It's pretty, pretty spaced out there. That's great. Um, thank you very much. I'm gonna hide that one. Looks like the majority of us do have a dedicated room with a desk though, so that's that's helpful. Um, but if you don't, don't worry. There's there We can make it work. Um, the best thing to do though is to find your very best workspace in your home. Whether that is, you know, whatever room that happens to be in, we'll talk about what, what goes into that and find that one and set it up. So that primary workspace would be the place where you do your, you do your keying and your mousing or your writing. Uh, you know, maybe that's project work or emails or assignments for school, online meetings or lessons, that real head down type of work. Uh, and the, the best practices for setting up this workspace look very similar to a traditional office setup. So, you know, if you think about the the, you know, how you have, if you had an office that was set up, you know, with, with ergonomics in mind and try to recreate that at home, you're on the right track. You, we want to ideally separate the keyboard and mouse and screen, right? So that means having an extra keyboard and mouse and not just working on the laptop. So that's the ideal situation. It means having the work surface at elbow level and the top of the screen just below eye level. So you're, it's impossible to set those lines up if you don't have a keyboard and mouse. I'll just say that so that it's clear. Um, the, the distance of the screen should be about an arm's length away. That is, that is a very, very general approximation though, but you can, you can get it about an arm's length away so that you, um, you, you're, you're, you can sit back and comfortably against the chair while viewing the screen. I want to make sure that the feet and back are supported and that there's minimal glare on your screen. If the table is too high, you might need to sit on a pillow. And it, the, most dining room tables and frankly most desks um, at, at about 30, 29 or 30 inches above the floor are too high for most people. Um, it, the, de the dining room table is designed for eating, which is, requires different movements than typing or mousing. And so, and you want the food to be closer to your, to your face. Uh, and so the, the dining room table is gonna usually be too high. So sitting on a pillow is a great way to elevate the body so that the elbow can be in line with the table. And if you don't have an external monitor, it's very, very simple to simulate one by putting your laptop screen on some books like you see here, or game boxes work well, or if you have a riser or a stand, that's obviously a good solution as well. Your seating option, um, you know, for, for students that have difficulty sitting still or adults uh, have difficulty sitting still, um, trying a wobble stool or a balance ball uh, is, is fine. Um, ideally, if you're going to sit all day, you should have some back support, but having a, you know, a wobble stool or a balance ball that is at the right height so that your, your elbow is still in, at, at desk height, it can provide um, a, a more active seated uh, position that, that is fine. There's a lot of do-it-yourself solutions that you can find online too, which are kind of fun for students uh, to, to have active seating options. If the table's too high, you can either sit on a, on a pillow like we just said, or you can bring the keyboard and mouse down to your elbow level. And a creative way to do that is using a game box. So we use this game box to bring the keyboard and mouse down to elbow level. Uh, another you know, way to do that is using a cutting board. Uh, something big and broad that you know is allows you to 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 feel very secure with it on your lap uh, or a lap desk if you happen to have a lap desk um, this is a great uh, way to to use that to it's essentially simulating a keyboard tray like you might have had in your office environment 
No matter how we sit though, we need to support the feet. Um, we need to support the feet with, with the knees at about a right angle, about 90 degrees. This uh, allows the back to relax and to receive the support from the chair. So whether it's a, a cardboard box or uh, a, a pillow or a cushion or some other sort of a, a box, um, supporting the feet is important. Mentioned a moment ago about avoiding glare. So the glare, glare comes in different forms and we want to be careful that we're not introducing glare in our home work environment. In an office environment, it's much more controlled and um, a lot of buildings <clears throat> are designed to, to control the glare from the windows uh, so that workers don't have to contend with that. But at home, our space is different and we, we like, you know, we have a lot of natural light and, it, and we, we want to be around that because it makes us feel good. But we need to be cautious about glare coming from overhead lights or behind windows that are open behind the monitor or behind the worker. Uh, the, the recommendation is, are, are these. Uh, if you're going to use a task light, uh, make sure that you shine it on the keyboard or the paperwork, the thing that needs illumination, not on the screen. It's, uh, it's, I, I, it's shining a, a task light onto your monitor and just creates too much of a brightness uh, and, and it could actually create a, a direct glare back into your eye. So not using a task light directly on the screen and closing the blinds behind the monitor. So in this picture, we see the blinds open behind the computer monitor and that creates too much light coming into the, to her eyes from around the screen and it fatigues the eyes trying to um, switch back and forth between that bright and darker, bright and darker, um, the, the, the contrast there. So closing those blinds is recommended and sitting with your, your yourself or your monitor perpendicular to the window will ensure that the light doesn't come directly onto the screen. So those are some recommendations to avoid glare. And you know, we need to consider the contact stress on our wrists and forearms. Uh, it's a, it's a, at home, our workstations are not, it's hard to make them perfect. Uh, and we may not have adjustable furniture. And so we may find ourselves in a situation like this but with this photo shows with the forearms or the wrists resting on the edge of a table, um, we can, if we can't adjust the, the workstation to minimize that, we can pad it and uh, we can use soft cloths, um, you know, fold up a washcloth or, or a small towel to pad the edge or um, a kind of a fun creative way is to use pipe insulation, foam, foam pipe insulation and you know, slice it down the side and you can attach that onto the edge for some padding. Um, sometimes just sitting closer reduces that pressure on the wrist. Uh, or, you know, if you have a, a, a palm support, some sort of a, a gel uh, palm rest, uh, that would be a good place to use that as well. All right, so I've just spent a lot of time talking about setting up the workstation, you know, using a keyboard and mouse and, and maybe a monitor, but I understand and I realize that we don't all have those accessories. So let's have you chime in here again on this poll and let me know, let us know what accessories do you have? Do you have, okay, this is interesting. So most of you have everything, have, have enough equipment to, to make a full workstation. That's actually surprising to me. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you. Um, and that's a little surprising, but that's, that's great. So um, a number of mouse only, some people with mouse and keyboard and some, and then, you know, an, a, a good number with no accessories at all, um, which I, I'm surprised, I'm not surprised by. I actually expected that number to be a little bit higher, but that's why we're polling. So we know. So thank you for your input there. Oops. I got a little ahead of myself. Okay, so if you don't have an external keyboard, it's it's no problem. I mean, if you can get one and if you can buy one, you know, you can find some pretty affordable keyboards online. I, you, I've I've seen decent keyboards for under twenty dollars. So I, you know, it's it is something if if you have the resources to do that. Um, I would suggest it, um, but if not, if nothing more, you can angle your laptop up slightly. Uh, 12 degrees is the angle that you want to aim for. Uh, at the re research has shown that angling the laptop at about 12 degrees can improve chest posture, chest position by, by bringing the elbows back 
and it can reduce some of the um, awkward posture of the, of the wrist, so it can improve the wrist position as well. And then raising that screen just a tad as it does can improve the neck posture also. So this is, um, can be achieved by, you know, you can purchase a wedge, some sort of a small laptop wedge, or you can make your own. Uh, we made one at home using a paper towel tube and some rubber bands. Uh, you can also use a small book or a three ring binder at the back of the laptop to prop it up a little. Um, if you have a mouse, you should use that mouse, in, even in this scenario, but even if you don't have a mouse, even if you don't have a keyboard, this at least is something you can do to improve the situation somewhat. Um, you know, it's good to support your arms on the table, but we want to, again, avoid the, the contact stress on the hard edges. And I just want to reiterate that this setup is not recommended for all day work. It's, it's only sort of a, a if nothing more kind of thing. If, if you don't have a keyboard, you can do this, uh, or you can do this for short durations of time, but not recommended for all day work because of the, the, the height of the screen um, being so low connected to the, to the keyboard. Okay, so even though you may have found your primary workspace and set it up as best you can, uh, it's recommended to change your posture often. And this is a recommendation that we make in, in the office and at school also. Uh, you know, at school, in, in the classroom, in, at least in grammar school, most lessons don't last longer than 20, 30 minutes because children need to get up and move. They need to change postures often. And so do adults. Uh, we, we need to move our bodies and we need to change our our position often. Uh, there's a saying in ergonomics that the your next posture is your best posture, and it's true. Uh, we can keep, and we can facilitate that at home by taking advantage of different rooms of the house. So we can take that portable laptop and we can work, for instance, in the kitchen. Uh, the kitchen, you know, having the counter space gives us a good, some good options for standing. Uh, if the counter is too low, you can try pulling out the, the cutting board from the, from the cabinet and uh, bring the, you know, if you have the, a, a floor mat that you stand on for washing dishes, bring that over as well to soften the standing. Um, but now I'd like to show you just a little video that talks a little bit more about the kitchen. The kitchen can offer a standing opportunity to mix in intermittently during your day. This, the kitchen counter may be the correct height as is, but we might need to adjust it accordingly to your body. So for me, the kitchen counter is too low because I need the counter to be, or the keyboard to be right at elbow level. So the keyboard is too low on the counter for me, but again, for you, it might be the correct height. But what I'm going to do is bring in some books and set my keyboard or my laptop on top of that. So now I have my keyboard at elbow level and I can push the screen back and open up that angle so that I can look down with my eyes. So tucking the chin and looking down with the eyes is a way to protect the neck instead of bending the head down. So this is suitable for short periods of time, maybe 20-30 minutes. I wouldn't work like this for hours and hours, um, but if you do like standing and that feels good to your body, you can also bring your external mouse and again another box or uh, books and, and attach your mouse here so you're in a more open chest position for your shoulders by using that mouse. So again, standing intermittently is a good idea to mix movement into your day, but we wouldn't recommend that you stand up for hours and hours without taking breaks for sitting and movement as well. Okay. The, another opportunity in your home is the living room uh, for some short duration alternative setups. Uh, if you're going to sit on the sofa, we need to make sure that your back is well supported and that the feet are supported as well. Uh, and, and getting the laptop off of the legs is important so that the heat doesn't build up um, on, our, on our body uh, from the machine, but also to position it more stably on your lap. So you can use a, a, a variety of, of devices to do that. And I'm going to show you another quick video of how that might work um, for working in the living room. Let's talk about working in the living room. 
<clears throat> the living room is a comfortable and comforting place to work, but does not always offer the support that your body needs. If you choose to sit in a lounging chair or on your sofa, the common postures that we tend to, to use might look like this, where we are hunched over the laptop here, or perhaps have the laptop on an ottoman or a coffee table, or maybe even leaning back into having the laptop on the legs. We want to be careful with putting the laptop directly on the legs because of the heat that might be created by the machine, but we also need to support the body. So the best thing to do in this case is to put a pillow behind your back to provide upright support where the ear is aligned with the shoulder, is aligned with the hip. Then we can put the laptop on our lap and keep the elbows next to the body. Instead of directly placing it on the legs, you can try a lap desk if you have one. If you have a lap desk, this is the time to try to use it. If you don't have a lap desk, you can get creative. You can use a game box. A nice wide game box works well for holding the laptop also. Or another option would be a piece of wood that you might have in your garage or this is a, a shelf from a, a bookshelf that I had that I didn't use this shelf anymore. So there's lots of options you can get creative and think about ways to support the laptop on your lap. The nice thing about having one that's wide enough though is because then you can use your mouse. So having that external mouse again is important even when you're working on your lap. Now, I, for me, the, the having the, the board right on my legs works really well because it's where my elbow level is. But if you're taller and you have more space below your arm, you may need to add a pillow on your lap underneath the board. This is too high for me, but again, might work well for you. Now, finally, if you do want to recline and put your legs up on the ottoman, which of course feels comfortable to the back, the recommendation I have is to place a pillow beneath your knees so that you support the back of your knee. You don't want to put extra pressure on the bottom of the knee, so putting a pillow underneath the knee supports the leg, Having a pillow behind your back supports the back. Having the board at elbow level supports the arms. And I can work here for a, a, a good amount of time in a supportive position. Okay. <clears throat> so we've talked about the kitchen, we've talked about the living room, but now let's talk about the floor. Uh, now I wanna be very clear that I do not recommend that you all start sitting on the floor. Uh, I do include it though here because some people I've heard from enough uh, workers and enough students that they like to sit on the floor. And so I wanna provide some recommendations for making that as best as it can, it can be to support your body. So if you already like to sit on the floor, let's make sure that we raise the work up off of the ground and maintain support for the body. So you can raise the work off of the ground with some sort of a, a, a tray or a, a small table table. Um, a bed tray works well. It's a nice height for sitting uh, on the floor. Using an ironing board works great here too, be, and it's adjustable so you can put it right at the correct height. But getting that support for the back against the couch or against the sofa uh, or a wall, I guess, um, is, is important to support the body. You can take it even you know, one step further, like this photo on the far right, where we have the keyboard um, on, and mouse down on the lap desk with the laptop screen up on the coffee table. So that's actually a pretty, pretty great setup um, if you are a floor sitter. But I will just say one more time, I am not recommending that you all go out and sit on the floor, but if you do, uh, go ahead and make some changes to support the body. 
The one place I would really avoid working and schooling from is bed. Uh, it is, it's, it's a tough one because it's very inviting. It's comfortable, it's comforting, it feels safe and private, and it feels like where we want to be during this time of uncertainty and uncomfortableness. Uh, but working in, working on the laptop in, in bed is, is very awkward on the body. There's, uh, hardly any way to get it to be good um, for have a good ergonomic setup in, in bed. I know you can Google different things about, you know, best way to set up your yourself in bed. Um, and you often end up with so many pillows and so much bolstering that it's just really not feasible. Um, you know, in ergonomics, we know that if a solution is not easy, people will not do it. And so I just say avoid working from bed if at all possible. Okay, so we've talked a lot about using the laptop. Um, and given the fact that most of you on the line are remote workers, I'm going to assume that you use a laptop, but I'm curious about tablet use. Um, is the tab, if you're a student or if you have a student that you're concerned about, does that, is the tablet a, a device that you use often? Looks like personal use in addition to, okay. All right, that's good. So um, thank you again for your input there. I'm going to give you some tips on, on tablet setup, um, just to, so that we are, are comprehensive and covering all things, but it sounds like it's not as big of an issue for the, the overall um, audience. But the best recommendations with using a tablet is to prop it up so that you're using it hands-free. There's different ways that you can do that. Um, you can use a cookbook stand, or I, I like the idea here with using a, a photo frame. Um, a, you know, you can get creative and build something out of Legos or have your child do that. Uh, there's different ways to prop that up. Uh, using a stylus can also help improve posture. It gets the arms a little bit closer to back towards the body, so it reduces the, sh the chest constriction. You can make your own to uh, stylus if you don't have one or you want a fun science project. Project. There's some tutorials on YouTube for that. Uh, we made one and it was, it was, it was doable and, and kind of fun. If you have a Bluetooth keyboard, you can see as we add um, the, the stylus and then the keyboard, the arms come closer and closer back to the body, meaning that they're reaching, they're not reaching so far forward. So it improves posture with everything you can add. Um, and if you're working using the laptop, or excuse me, the iPad on the couch, we want to support the arms with pillows. Headphones um, are, uh, are something to consider. This was a big aha for me in watching students and talking to teachers. Um, using headphones can really improve posture and focus. It helps to avoid you know, leaning into the speakers to be able to hear them so you can sit back with a neutral, head, a neutral neck posture. It can really help focus and, um, and improve focus and attention span for students that get easily distracted. Um, we do want to be careful, though, that we are not um, damaging our ears, and so keep Keeping volume uh, less than 60% of the range is the recommendation there. So headphones can help, but we need to be mindful in terms of how we use them. I thought I'd throw in some tips about using your phone. Uh, it's probably not your primary device that you're using for work, but I, I know you're using it. We all are, maybe even more than we were before. So the best recommendations to protect your thumb and your wrist and your neck uh, is to support the arms so that you're not looking down so far to the screen. Uh, using your voice to intertext, so whether that's with a dictate uh, feature or Siri or some sort of a voice to text feature um, is good. And it's, it's much faster as is uh, swipe. The, the, the swipe feature is a fast and efficient way to intertext as well. So we can you know, not add additional strain onto our body by using our, our phone in our off time. It's, we're at the point now where if you haven't started wiggling in your chair and you haven't stood up to stretch, you might, uh, you might want to take a moment to stretch your body. Uh, it's it's a, the, one of the things that I've heard from a lot of workers with this change to our work environment is the lack of movement. Um, so we want to make sure that we are moving our bodies regularly. Um, if, if you haven't in the last 40 minutes, do it now, but stay with me because we're going to keep moving through the slides. But we need to make time to move. 
We can do that between our work and school tasks uh, by utilizing the normal transitions in our, in our work day or our school day. For instance, um, in our family, we take a walk to school every morning. Obviously, school is in our home, but we take a walk at the same time and we walk around the block and then we get started. So we've started the day with a teeny bit of movement and we've um, set up our, our brains to know that now is time for school. Um, you can simulate the transitions between classes or between meetings by walking up and down stairs or hallways. So there's ways to move, move during the day. Uh, if you have lectures or meetings that you can just watch, uh, you can stretch during those. You can do some very you know, stationary exercises during those meetings. Um, and if you, if you have trouble remembering to move, which a lot of people do, using a timer is a great way to make sure that you're getting some movement every 30 minutes. Uh, and just, you know, finding time for the PE during your remote schooling day, you know, making regular exercise part of your routine is, is important. And we all, uh, some of us are doing a good job of that and some of us are, are not. And so I just want to invite you to, to, you know, get regular exercise, try different workouts. There's a lot of free material on, on YouTube. There's this alphabet challenge that I've seen a lot of people trying where it helps build a, a circuit, uh, uh, training for you based on the, the spelling of your name. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we can get movement into our day. And with that, I'm kind of curious how much physical activity you're getting. So if you would quickly chime in and let us let me know, are you moving more and, and doing more workouts? Or are you not moving as much? Or were you the same as before? Like, where are you in terms of uh, your movement during the day? Let's see. Yeah, okay. So that's interesting. I'm I have found my personally I am I'm moving more and getting in more workouts, which I don't I guess I'm not alone on. Um it's it's interesting to me that more people are finding time for workouts, which is great. I mean, who knew that we would uh, that we would have that. <laughs> so um, there is a good number of people though that are getting less movement during the day and less dedicated workouts. So um, helping, you know, hoping that you, those of you that are not getting quite as much movement, can find some strategies to work it into your day. Um, it's it's really important for your body and for your mind. All right, so we also need to take care of our eyes. Um, when we stare at the computer screen for, for long periods of time, our eyes only focus on that certain distance away. So if, the recommendation is that every 20 minutes you focus on something that's far away, 20 feet away for 20 seconds. That allows the muscles behind the eyes to change their, their position and to get some exercise. We want to balance our that that screen time, that two-dimensional screen time with three-dimensional handwork, whether that is crafting or arts or building or making, whatever suits you, um, working that into your schedule and working in activities that require a change in focus from near to far. So Frisbee is a good one, um, playing catch is a good one, playing the game of I Spy with your, with your family where you're focusing on things that are nearer and further helps to, again, exercise the muscles behind the eyes. And then considering the blue light from our screens, um, turning off the screens a couple hours before bed is the best practice for not having the blue light affect our sleep patterns. So that's the big concern is that we, you know, that we have too much blue light, um, which signals awake to our brain. And if we have too much of that near bedtime, then our body doesn't know that it's time to turn off and then our sleep becomes interrupted or, or um, we don't get enough sleep. So turning off those screens um, before bed with a couple hours before bed is a way to protect against that. Uh, using a blue light filter uh, all day is is fine. That's not, you know, the, the, our main source of blue light comes from the sun and not from the screens. Um, so, you know, if those blue light filters can actually be quite helpful. I want to spend just a little bit time here. We've talked a bit about a lot about the physical setup, but I want to make sure that we address the mental and the social aspects of our well-being as well, because it's not just about our physical setup. You know, we, with the, the cognitive load that we talked about, the locus of control, the motivation and the, the being connected, all of these aspects are part of our whole holistic well-being, and we need to think about those too. Uh, a, a good strategy for for keeping keeping ourselves um, well is to keep a routine and schedule. Uh, you can 
you know, maintain a good balance by creating boundaries and making a routine for your, your work time and your personal time. So whether that routine, you know, should include, you know, your, your normal activities like showering and getting dressed, um, you know, having some kind of a transition time into working. It may not be a commute where you sit in a car, but it might be sitting out, you know, sitting with a cup of coffee and looking at the birds out the window. That might be your new commute. Um, planning in time for exercise and keeping standard meal times is helpful uh, just because it keeps a sense of normalcy and we, we stay, um, we stay, we, we can keep up our nutrition. And shutting down the computer at the end of the workday really helps to close off that, that bound, create that boundary between work and personal. It's important that we don't um, keep the same expectations that we used to have for ourselves. Uh, things are changed. Things are different. You are less productive than you normally are, and that's okay. And we have to give ourselves a little bit of space here and know that that's okay. And I, I think most bosses and most teachers and, you know, most people understand that and you got to give yourself a little break here. Having a schedule is especially helpful for students uh, that have anxiety or issues with transitions. So keeping that schedule is good for students, especially if they can have some input on that schedule, helps increase their feelings of control. Okay, we talked about that locus of control. And frankly, as a parent trying to work from home, a school schedule gives, a work, the, gives us working parents some breathing room. So if our kids know what they're supposed to do at 1030, they're not gonna come knocking on the door asking, what am I supposed to do now? I, I think it's important to, I'm not going to go through each of these, these tips here, but if you, are, if you are given some flexibility with your routine or your schedule, whether that's because you're a worker or because you're a high school student that is, you know, said you have to get this done in the week, but figure out when you want to get it done, uh, you know, getting some assistance on time management and learning some tips for time management can really help us not bog down our, our working memory, trying to remember things all the time and not make us feel like we're not productive. And so there's, there's a lot of um, very, you know, this is a list that I, I got off, off um, a, a simple Google search that you can find as well, or you can come back and look at these slides, but finding some time management tips will help. I think it's important that we stay organized. This is not, you know, new to the COVID-19 necessarily, but it might be. If students are new to email and they've never used email before and they're receiving all these emails from their teachers, that can feel very overwhelming. So teaching them and helping them learn how to organize the mail they receive can help um, reduce that, you know, that, that cognitive overload on them. Um, and, you know, just keeping things organized. If some, some school districts are still providing paper packets of worksheets and that and keeping things organized will help reduce the, that constant working um, cognition of, of trying to figure out where things are and, and feeling frustrated with the clutter. All right, this one is, uh, this, we're almost to the end here, and this is one of my favorite poll questions. Um, I, it feels like we spend our whole life on these video calls and meetings right now, but how many hours per week do you spend on your video calls? And, and this is a total. So think about your school, your personal, your social, all of it together. And then I want you to answer the same question below for your, um, for your student. So. Sorry, I think that I, I the, the. I, this is Jessica, I realize the number two should be how much time does your student or child yeah. spend on video calls and meetings? The top one is for yourself. Yeah, so we're curious about the, the adults on the, and then if you, if you have a student in your household, how many hours are they spending on video calls and meetings? And that would be, again, this is not just formal meetings with your team, but if you're doing client interface or, or other work. So trying to add all that up. Okay, looks like we're in moderate and low. Okay, good, thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you so much for your input there. All right. So we'll just give a few tips on video meetings here. Um, I think by this point, you've all found your way <laughs> on how to, to work in your video meetings, but being comfortable and avoiding extra stress uh, is the key. Uh, you know, if you, if you can stay off video, great. Um, a trick to staying hidden in a gallery view is muting yourself, because if you don't 
uh, if you don't talk, your face won't pop up big on the screen. You know, finding good lighting so that you feel good about the way you look. Uh, have you know, using an external webcam for the same reason. Be you know, putting the laptop on something so that you're not holding it in your hands, and making sure that you have a strong internet connection. All of these things will avoid any additional stress that might be associated with being on a video meeting. Um, to make things more private, you know, make sure that your housemates know when you're going to be on so that they don't come barging in asking you a question if you're on an important uh, webinar, for instance. <laughs> um, that will help, you know, minimize the family interference. Um, and using virtual backgrounds, I think we've all figured out how to do that by now, which is kind of fun. But you can also do the old fashioned way with just hanging a sheet on a wall or on a you know, clothesline type string across the room or just sitting up against the wall as a way to minimize um, exposure to your, to your house and your, your room contents. When we're working on these small screens, it can be very tricky, especially for students that are watching a lesson or a lecture while also trying to take notes on the same screen. Uh, when I was in school, I took notes on paper, but now most students take notes on their computer. And so if you're trying to watch a lecture and also take notes, that can be tricky. Um, or, you know, workers that are working on multiple files at one time that may be used to having two monitors, it can, it can be a challenge. So if you have the advantage of having a second screen, it's recommended to keep your highest quality screen at your midline with the second monitor on the side being close to the main monitor. That's the key. So not having them two separate from one another, which side doesn't really matter. If you don't have two screens, you can use a split screen function on your, on, your, on your single screen where you have your lecture on one side and your notes on the other. Or if you have the technology in your home, you can use screen mirroring to bounce your, uh, your lecture or, your, the, or the meeting or the lesson or whatever it is to your, your television using a smart TV or an Apple TV. And then you can sit with a lap desk or something to support your laptop for taking notes. So that's a kind of a fun high tech way to do it if you have access to that. And finally, you know, we have all probably done our share of Zoom happy hours and family meetings and hangouts and that by now. And I will, I will be honest and say that I am, you know, eight weeks in, I'm feeling a little fatigued by those. Um, and I think it's just because I'm, I'm, I'm tired of not being able to actually see my friends in person. But I think it's important that we stay connected with family and friends in whatever format that that takes, uh, whether it's, you know, the, the nice thing about things where you're doing crafts or hanging out, you know, doing something with your hands is you don't have to face, you know, see everybody the entire time. You can kind of focus on something else. Um, but there's lots of ways that you can get creative to um, stay connected with your family and friends. All right, and so looking at the clock, I want to make sure we have a little time for some questions here. So before we before we get to questions, though, I'm just like you to chime in on one last poll. Curious if you learned anything today that you will use, uh, and, and if not, thanks for joining us anyway. <laughs> That's great. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear it, and I'm glad that you're motivated to make some changes right away. That, that feels very, very, um, very, very satisfying. So thank you for your input on that. And we are, oops, I'm gonna get that off there. So if you have, um, if you'd like, we are gonna answer some questions. So we'll open it up in just one second here. But if there, if you'd like additional um, information on schooling at home, uh, handouts, I, there's some handouts in English and in Spanish and videos in English and in Spanish, you can access them at learnergo.com. And there's more resources for workers and students at the UC Ergo website. You see the website there. And you can always email me. All, of, all the different emails come to the same place. So um, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, we'll go ahead and take some questions. Thank you again so much, Melissa. And um, just so that everybody knows, we will be sending out the resources and links and a recording uh, tomorrow afternoon after everything is able to get uploaded online. And for those of you who sent out a slide request, I'll get to those as soon as we have a PDF of the slides. I'm going to go ahead and start asking some questions. Some of them you might have already um, answered throughout it, so you can kind of answer those ones quickly. But um, one, one attendee asks, what's the best you can do with no office or desk chair, only a kitchen table and chair, or an upholstered chair and table? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, I hope that the, the slides that I showed in the beginning answered that, but you know, pillows are your friend, pillows and boxes are your friend in that say, in that case. So sitting on a pillow to raise your, your elbow level up to be even with the table, putting a box under your feet. Um, and th that's really a quick way to, to make your kitchen table work. And you can refer back to those slides where we've offered some tips on that. Yes, and I think the next question is very similar that they like to stand, but the books on the coffee table aren't working. And I think you answered that with the countertop question. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, the countertop is great. And, um, you know, books are fine, but you, know, you got to have some really tall books. I found that game boxes work really well because you can get, you know, three or four inches at a time and you don't have to stack so many. So if you're, if you're tall, think about that. Another uh, participant um, said they have a cataract in their left eye and they use a laptop at home, but at work they have a laptop and a large screen. Do you know of any options to help reduce eye strain? Wow. Well, if you, you know, getting a large screen is going to make it make things easier. Um, if that is not an option, um, then I th the, the tips for resting the eyes often and, you know, we, there's, there's specific tips for contrast and you know, we wanna make sure that things are, are, are good enough contrast that they're easy to discern and making sure that the font is big enough on the screen. Um, so there's a, we could talk a whole hour about <laughs> visual ergonomics, um, but I would, I would say the best thing to do if you can't get a big monitor is to make sure that you're taking regular breaks for your eyes. That 20, 20, 20 rule um, is more important than ever, especially if you have a, a condition with your vision. Thanks for that. Another question that a couple of people asked actually is if you have any thoughts or advice on using kneeling chairs. Hmm, that's fun. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the kneeling chair falls into the same category as the exercise ball and the wobble stool and, you know, those backless types of chairs. Um, and the problem with them is they're backless. And um, the, the, the advantage to them, however, and the kneeling chair also is that they, they, if, if they're the right height for you, they can position your spine very in a very neutral position, neutral posture. And so having the, you know, a, a, a kneeling chair or a ball that, that opens up the pelvic angle a little bit and allows the spine to stack uh, in a neutral way can be good. However, um, all day use means that you're never letting your, your muscles rest in your back and, and in, your, in your core. And so it's I, the, where I'm going with this is that it's probably fine for short-term use, but it's probably not something you want to use for eight hours a day. Thank you. Uh, we did have a couple of questions about any ideas of glare filters that can be used for laptops. Mm -hmm. So a glare filter really only does, you really only get a benefit from a glare filter if you have a shiny screen. And I know a lot of, um, we're at the point in technology where a lot of the screens are reflective. Um, so if, if you're in a, if you're sitting in a place where you have light reflecting off your screen, it feels like a mirror where you can, you know, kind of see yourself in the screen, then the glare filter can work well. The problem with the glare filter is it makes the screen darker. And so if you, it, it, which can make it harder to see, which can make, make you lean in closer to the screen. So um, if you, the best thing to do is to reposition the monitor so that you don't have glare. Again, you know, not having the windows open around the screen and not having a light shining on it. But if you can't get around that and you, you still have a glare, then a glare filter can be good, but you need to make sure that you adjust the brightness settings so that you can still see the material very well. Thank you. I know we're getting closer to the end of time, but I'm going to try to squeeze in a couple more questions. Um, we did have some questions about, um, the uh, laptop angle and why the laptop angle is better, but the keyboard angle, um, laptop angle is better while the keyboard angle is better neutral or negative tilt. Mm, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> The, the keyboard angle, the, the improvement that you get from the key, uh, the laptop angle, sorry, so the, the improvement that you get from the laptop angle comes, it, it's, it's different because of the front or the leading edge of the laptop. So a keyboard, a normal keyboard doesn't have two to four inches of plastic um, in front of it. It's just the keyboard. So you, you can, you can 
maintain a neutral risk position when you have the work surface at the right level. But if the work surface is too high um, and, and then you have that leading edge of the laptop, it'll press into the wrist. And so then la angling the laptop up a bit helps remove or that, that contact point at the wrist there. Um, frankly, if you're working on a keyboard, you know, standard keyboard without a laptop and the table is too high, you're still going to have similar issues. Um, but that's a great question, actually. I'm, I'm glad that that one came up. Um, but yeah, it, it really has to do with that front edge of the laptop and the pressure that that can put on the wrist when the desk is too high. That actually is great. It leads into the next two questions you could probably answer in one fair swoop, <laughs> which are, uh, what are some ideas about reducing that contact stress on those hard edges, as well as um, how, uh, with, if somebody is too short for their feet to hit the floor from their dining room table and chairs, that, that contact by resting on the bar underneath the, cha uh, the seat? Hmm. Um, so the wrist one, let me just do that one quickly um, there you know if you have a, a palm support some sort of a gel palm support great use it but if not you can take a, a towel and fold it up so that it's not more than you know an inch high um, you can use you know um, the pipe insulation that foam insulation that I showed a picture of you can slice that open and put it on the edge of your table so there's different ways that you can work with padding um, with the leg for your wrists but the the leg one I'm I'm not exactly sure I'm assuming that the, the question is referring to the, the the bar underneath the chair that you would maybe be trying to rest your feet on like as a footrest um, and that's not an ideal situation because it, it it closes the knee angle up too much and it can impede the the circulation in the leg so it's best if your feet can't touch the floor at your dining room table to put a box under your feet but it shouldn't be so high that your that your knees are higher than your hip so you just want to maintain a 90 degree angle in your knee so the box ends up only being like you know, three inches high. It doesn't need to be a very big box. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to really quick look through. Um, I did have a few questions about the resource for the 12 degree angle positive tilt, and um, we can send that out to you guys. Um, yes. With the resources that'll be going out tomorrow. And um, a few people also asked about the ergonomic software for stretch breaks and reminders. I do know UC Berkeley has one and there's, there's a lot of other ones and we can send that out as well. Mm -hmm. And okay, so there's only, let's see, one more question um, is, they didn't hear anything about bifocal glasses and the difference needed in monitor height for those, for those people. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a critical issue for many workers. Uh, they said yellow eyeglasses can reduce the glare for workers also. What is your related recommendation with regard to people using uh, bifocal lenses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's two, there's two questions there. The bifocal lens um, uh, is, the, the, the guideline is if you wear a bifocal or a progressive lens that the monitor should be lower than it would be if you don't wear those lenses because the, the goal is keeping the, the chin level. So if you wear a bifocal and you are trying to read at eye level, you're gonna to have to lift your chin up, which is bad for your neck. So the recommendation if you wear a bifocal is to have the screen a little lower. This is the one case where it actually works well to have a laptop screen because it actually is <laughs> closer to the right height for bifocal wearers, so that's, um, that's that's good for their for, for that um, population. Uh, and as far as the yellow glasses, uh, that can help reduce the blue light. It, it acts as a blue light filter. Um, and yeah, again, the, the the main thing to take home with the blue light is to is to reduce the exposure at the end of the day before going to bed. Okay, great. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Melissa, for all of your expertise and really being able to kind of get through all of these answers and questions. Um, in general, I just want to thank everybody else for being here. Uh, and if anybody needs anything else, you can email me at coehce at berkeley.edu. And again, you will be getting an email tomorrow afternoon um, at about noon Pacific with all of the resources, a recording, and your link to the evaluation where you can get your certificate of completion. So everybody have an enjoyable day and thank you so much for your time.